All right, so we're jumping ahead a little bit, talking about a composer who was definitely influenced by John Cage, um, and that's Steve Reich. And we're gonna talk a little bit about minimalism in general, but we're gonna start off by talking about one of his works, which is called Music for Pieces of Wood. And it was written in 1973. And what exactly does the piece consist of? Well, it, can, it consists of... Right, which is a rhythm we might recognize from another famous piece. Clapping, clapping music, music. Which right. this piece is related to yeah. and grew out of. Mm -hmm. um, it's for five players, and the pieces of wood that they're playing are usually claves. Mm -hmm. But we, we've seen it for different uh, instrumentation, right? Yeah, you can literally just have a slat of wood. That you, you tune. You that, and they can it. be tuned by making them different lengths. Right, yeah. right. And so he has these pitches, but that's not even... It's not really it's, about the pitches. It's not about the yeah. pitches. It's really about this idea of rhythm and phasing. Right. So again, a partially conceptual piece, yeah. which is what we were talking about in the last segment. Right. Yeah. And, and something you said in the last segment about privileging certain sounds mm -hmm. and not others. Um, uh, and then in this case, all sounds, because these are not violins. These right. are not pianos, or at least kind of cultivated sounds. Right. The in, pieces of wood. Right. In theory, you don't, um, you don't need to know anything to play this piece, although it definitely takes a level of concentration and sort of rhythmic ability to play it correctly, but it's not like you need an expensive instrument right. that is engineered for a specific purpose right. to and play for, this piece. Right. And I think for Reich, the clapping music, which it grew out of, it was so he could have a piece to play anywhere. Right. But uh, I, I think you're, you're right about, you know, the simplest part, though, it opens with just this, basically, the beat, the yeah. tempo. Like one player, yeah, one player is just playing Dump, the beat. Bump, bump, and that player bump, actually bump. does that for the entire piece. And the other four players sort of move around that beat. And that's actually the hardest part to play, is it's, what I've heard. Right. So it's, it, it's not that you need training to just keep a beat, but actually to keep it steady yeah. is, uh, it's is really quite difficult. a challenge. Yeah. So the, the mechanism of the piece is something that Reich used a lot, this idea of phasing. You know, and in this case, taking that rhythm, da 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 mm -hmm. and just shifting it over slightly, creating these canons then, mm -hmm. these very close canons. So um, what's an example of a canon that we would... What, if oh, we were to like, illustrate so what a the simplest is. example of a, uh, a canon is like row, row, row your boat. Right. So, with right. people coming in at different intervals mm -hmm. so that it's going on at different times all at the same time. Did I explain that well? Layers? Uh, no, I, right. Yeah. Right. Row, row, row your boat. And, but in this case, it's like doing row, row, row your boat. But the moment I say the first row, you say the first row. Right. And so it's, it's creating almost this kind of mirroring or this, well, phasing. Yeah. Uh, this immediate mirror image. Right. And that creates this amazing rhythmic, almost like a web, almost if like a polyphonic rhythmic web or tapestry. Right. A tapestry, that's a great word and sort of constantly shifting um, something that is simple in, in concept, mm -hmm. but elaborate in execution. So we, we call Reich a minimalist composer. Mm -hmm. um, and he has written so many works that are um, in the canon, to use a different, um, uh, not a canon. <laughs> a different okay. meaning of canon. Thank you. We get Thanks. it. Thanks. <laughs> for, yeah, I needed the assist. Yeah. But um, so this, this might be the most kind of minimalist piece that we could imagine. There are a lot of varieties of minimalism. But, yeah. But do you agree with that, that there's something just at the core of minimalism about this piece? Yeah, I think so. Although you could argue that to really go back to the true roots of minimalism, you would have to go back 10 years to the early sort of tape loop uh, pieces of Steve Reich. Mm -hmm. But this is basically the same idea. It's just there's a little bit more um, decision making, I think, that goes into it. Right. So I'm glad you mentioned that because his early tape pieces like uh, Come Out or It's Gonna Rain, yeah. and he would set up two loops going kind of at the same time. But because of small differences in the machines, those loops would phase out of time with each right. other and then kind of come back mm -hmm. in, which in many ways is, is what happens uh, in an analog way uh, with, with this piece. Right. Um, 
So what about the, though, the idea that minimalism is kind of reaction to the Darmstadt school, to the uber hyper complexity of the modernists, that we look mm -hmm. at minimalism as, as a reaction, a, a rejection of that? Yeah, I think it definitely was. I mean, it was a rejection of sort of, um, not all, but maybe a lot of the values of the Darmstadt movement. Um, and by values, I mean um, sort of highly esoteric, intellectual, specific, sort of painstaking construction of music. Um, I think minimalism was really trying to do the opposite in a lot of ways, although there are, there are certain ways in which they're similar. Right, and the but, idea that you kind of set up a structure right. and, then and then let watch it play it go. out. Yeah. It's almost as if the beginning of computers and programming yeah. have some sort of crossover with this, um, but that's for another yeah. vodcast. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, for, for me, when I look at the differences uh, between minimalism, which really grows in America and has an influence of pop music and jazz, a lot yeah. of kind of urban sounds, mm -hmm. but also you know, for some of these composers, and uh, uh, the influence of Asian philosophy and mm -hmm. Buddhism. Right. Um, in Reich's case, West African drumming as well as uh -huh. something that he studies yeah. in intensely. Because there is minimalism that occurs over like a very broad canvas, a slow, steady state, static right. minimalism. This is not that. This has a really a, a beat and a regularity and a re repetition. Right. So in that way already, it's so different from the music of Boulez and Stockhausen and Nono of the, the Darmstadt school. Yeah. Um, it, it is super clear. It, the harmony does not change much. Mm -hmm. And the harmony itself is pretty simple. And in, in, a, in a lot of ways, it crosses over with popular music. Yeah, and the types well. of harmonies that are used. Right. And, and I think that's, that's a big part of why the response to minimalism has been so, so overwhelming and large and influential over the decades that it's existed is that it is something that a lot of people can relate to in a more immediate sort of aural way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that people uh, right, respond to the surface of that, that it's... Yeah. Um, we could call it more accessible, but that's, I don't know about that word. It's yeah. certainly more immediately understandable yeah. and comprehensible. And there's an influence between, like, um, you listen to Baba O'Reilly by The mm. Who or some other, or um, some Radiohead. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, Suzanne Vega has a song <laughs> that is, is, takes right from Philip Glass, yep. you know. So there's a lot of crossover that right. way with popular music. Right, it's, a, it's, it's music that's created in a language that is close to the language that many people sort of speak and understand in music. And, and as much as the Darmstadt School is constantly changing, second to second, beat to beat, measure to measure, right. we're hearing new sounds, we're hearing this constant motion. Minimalism wants to emphasize the, the power of small changes yeah. over time, mm -hmm. that in that repetition, suddenly a small change has a much stronger impact on us than the idea of constantly changing. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we'll def we should talk more then about minimalism and, and really why, you know, why it's been so successful in a way. Uh, minimalist composers then, but now post-minimalist composers. Yeah. So this is a world that you grew up knowing and definitely. Hearing. I think for me in my teens and in college, this was minimalism and post minimalism were really the musical forces that um, that I was thinking about, and that it seemed like a lot of my peers were were very seriously considering as sort of the basis for music making and composition. And post minimalism being almost just a kind of evolution of minimalism. Yeah. Minimalism plus. Yeah. Right? M more stuff mm -hmm. happening more uh, possibilities or something like that. But that's just the nature of the progression of time and movements building on other movements. Well, let's, so. let's talk about that in yeah. a subsequent vodcast. All right. Great.